He'll be talking all about what nature can teach us about speed. Uh, Rick Paulus will be here. He was a White House calligrapher in April to talk all about uh, his adventures there and why uh, you needed calligraphy in the White House. Whose budget was that anyway? Um, Patrick Hunt will be here in April to talk all about the naval and nautical surprises of Hannibal and the beginnings of biological warfare. Um, also in uh, April, we'll have Roy Liggett. You'll know Roy as a member. And also, you may not know, he's an amateur archaeologist. And uh, there's a great history of amateur archaeology. He'll be talking to us about whales in Bakersfield. Um, there They were. Uh, Dewey Hines, well, no, March 27th. Be sure to mark your calendar because this will be the Celebrity Sailor Roast for none other than Terry the Man Anderlini. Uh, that's a target-rich environment for a roast. Uh, so be sure to bring your great Anderlini stories. Uh, Dewey Hines will be here on uh, March 20 to talk about coming of age at the Yacht Club, St. Francis of the 1950s. Uh, a distinguished professor uh, stuck with my name, spelled differently, Ron Young from UC Berkeley, will be here to talk all about wave, uh, ocean wave energy. Caleb Payne, the Olympian, the only American medalist in the last Olympics, will be here on March the 6th to talk about with the bronze and the mantle going for the gold. Um, on March 20, February 27th, uh, Bill Wells will talk about the history of yachting in the Delta. And next week, four-star general Gordon R. Sullivan will talk all about um, the national security implications and how we'll protect our nation from climate change. Uh, he supervised a giant study on this subject, and he knows a bit of what he speaks. Uh, and he's a four-star general, my heavens. A little bit about our speaker today. Um, it's always fascinating to listen to how people come to this stage. Uh, he started sailing at the age of six in, yes, an opti, in, on the French Riviera. Darn it. I'm thinking about the French Riviera as I look out these windows right now. Um, between uh, Nice and Marseille, there's a beautiful little harbor. Um, Harvé, I'm saying it. Uh, anyway, he raced there in his opti. Uh, and then at age 10, for the first time, he raced a laser in his first laser race. He was over early. We've been there. I, I resemble that remark. Uh, and of course, being over early, he decided to bang a corner. He said, what the heck, he banged the right corner. And he finished the race 20 minutes ahead of second place. <laughs> So much for banging the corner. Uh, at age 20, his most memorable experience in sailing was being in Hawaii, where he was a master's candidate. Uh, and uh, he was sailing on a uh, Swan 45. <clears throat> and he went up on the spinnaker guy and went out to the end of the guy holding on to it over the water, going about six knots and 15, 18 knots of breeze. And they disconnected the pole, and he was floating out there, hanging over the water with, uh, on a, f flying essentially a kite in a new way. He went on to uh, even um, more crazy things. He got a PhD in naval architecture from UC Berkeley. Now, there's a challenging adventure. Um, he's put it to amazingly good use. Uh, as one of the founding team members and the CTO of Principal Power, they've uh, raised an A and a B round. They've raised $80 million um, in, uh, funding to date. They're just opening a C round. They're in early revenue stage, and he's going to tell you about the incredible technology that they're pioneering to uh, with offshore wind. So please welcome our speaker today, Dominique Rodier. Dominique. <laughs> Thank you, Ron. I, every time I come to the San Francis, I have to wear my full weather gear because I'm very senior. And today, you know, even though I drove, it feels like, you know, it's no exception. So it's great to, great to be here today. Uh, thank you for, for the invitation. Um, I'm going to talk about offshore wind. So offshore wind is, is a, new, um, it's a new industry. Um, but before I do that, I have to switch slides. So a little bit about principal power or vision to be the leader in deep water offshore wind development. Uh, so those are very big wind turbines that we're putting out in, in the ocean. And I'll explain a little bit more the, the details. Uh, our company uh, headquarters in, in Emeryville, California, so just across the bay. Um, we've got offices in Emeryville, in Aix-en-Provence, 
and in Lisbon, so you know, same as Hawaii, we, we like to pick the right places to be. Uh, <laughs> and, and we think that offshore wind is going to be the future. Why am I here? I think that this, this, this picture is, is very relevant. You know, climate change is, is, is real. Uh, we see major fires, we see you know, major flooding. But as one mentioned, I'm a naval architect, and so I have to show some equations. Obviously, you know, it's a floating system for me. There's the weight, it, you know, that, that pushes down and the buoyancy of the system pushes it up. Now, most of you guys are sailors, so you understand that when there is wind, you know, the system will heal and, and the floater will, whatever floater it is, will compensate, whether it's a bear, uh, a boat, or a wind turbine. It's the same concept. Um, we'll look a lot about industrialization, so how to make multiple of those, and there's really not a big difference between a, a wind farm and a one design fleet, or a lot of floating bears. Okay, uh, George Sopar, this is what I want to talk to you uh, today, a little bit about um, the industry, why floating wind. We're going to talk about the prototype that we developed uh, in 2011. We, inst we fabricated, installed it for five years, produced about 17 gigawatt of electricity, and decommissioned it. We'll talk about pre-commercial projects, what are we in right now, and, and what is the future of, of offshore wind. This is, this is a real industry. Um, you know, there's about 18 gigawatt of installed capacity in offshore wind. 16 of those are in the North Sea, two gigawatt in, in China, and we have 30 megawatt on, on the East Coast, go US. <laughs> Uh, it's, it's our first project. The U.S. is actually quite growing, and we'll talk a little bit about that towards the end. But this is what a, a wind farm looks like, one of them. The, the turbine goes into a foundation, and the foundation goes into the, the seabed. So this is where floating wind is. We call it fixed floating wind because the, the turbine is actually fixed to, to the seabed. So you have to be in, in shallow waters, obviously. So you need good wind, good shallow waters. So what you see here is, is the North Sea. Uh, a little bit on the west coast of the US and, and China. This is what the market is mostly developing. But what, what if you want to go further from shore? What if you don't want to go in deeper waters? California, for example, if we go five miles off, we're in 700 meters of, of water depth. So being able to make those turbines float just all of a sudden opens up huge markets for, for, for the industry. We're talking about California, we're talking about Hawaii, we're talking about Japan, very deep water, Korea. <laughs> Uh, Taiwan, south of uh, Australia, and, and, and that's really what's, what's important, is, is extend this niche industry to, to deeper waters. Uh, so why offshore? It's the largest grow rate in renewable energy today. Uh, there was 16 gigawatt of installed capacity last year. Two gigawatt were installed in 2018, so huge growth rate, more than 20% per year. Very high wind. Uh, when you're on land, when you're close to land, the wind kind of slows down at night and you've got this thermal effect that everybody knows about, you know, the warm, the, the, the water cooling down and things like that. If you're 10, 15 miles offshore, you know, those of you guys have, you know, gone to Hawaii, you know that when the wind blows, it just blows, you know, if you touch that system, then, then you have it for, for weeks. And, and so being offshore uh, makes sense. Uh, the challenge is, is obviously the, the water depth. Those turbines are extremely heavy. I'll take, give you one, one number. The biggest turbine today are 1,000 tons. The nacelle is 500 tons. The tower is 500 tons. That's how big of a system we're designing to. That's our payload. It's incredible. And we'll talk more about size as well. But you know, how do you make those systems float? Um, some advantages of, of being floating, obviously, further from shore, deeper water, and, and larger farms. And so when you combine all of these together, all of a sudden you're talking about you, you know, a, you know, a one gigawatt power plant that's made from renewable. And, and that's really what, what, what we're after. We're opening the market to deeper waters. And, uh, and um, um, yeah, well, you know, so, so that's, 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 that's kind of what the, the system looks like. So you, what you see on the left are the, the, the existing sol solutions. Uh, the, the monopile is, is on, the far, on the far left, so that's just the continuation of the tower that goes straight to the seabed. As you're going deeper and the turbine gets bigger, then the forces become too big and your monopile cannot sustain the bottom. So what you do is you have to widen the base. And so then you move to jacket or tripods and those are the, the, the two. So this is just to take the overturning moment and having a bigger force. And then what you start looking in after are the type of floaters. And they're very similar to oil and gas floaters, semi-submersible, uh, tension-led platforms. It's, it's a platform who's actually 
uh, instead of having a catenary anchor like we're used to on, on boats, it's, it's actually tethers that are under tension and the tension is giving you the stability. And then spar platforms are, are another concept which is great for oil and gas, uh, but which is very deep. So uh, the wind float is, is a semi-submersible type and, and I'll start talking about uh, what it is. So this is a picture of the wind float. Um, it's, it's a turbine, three, three columns, and, and some plates uh, at the bottom. Uh, it's extremely uh, efficient in terms of cost. We really look very carefully at reducing the cost everywhere. So why for three columns instead of four? You know, we're only paying for three, so lots of uh, optimization. But when you're doing something like this, what's, what's very important is to reduce the risk and to reduce the cost at the same time. And this is the only way we can do the projects that we're doing is if we can finance those projects. And so a lot of what we're doing is, is about risk reduction and, and, and cost. Just um, you know, looking at you know, some of the, the specifics, uh, what turbine agnostic, why? Well, we're just a foundation designer. It's kind of, you, know, you have a choice of sales. Well, you, you know, the, the owner has a choice to use a turbine and we try to work with all turbine manufacturers. Those are very similar turbines than the one that you see on shore. Uh, there's some, some tweaks in, te, you know, in marionization, but, but that's about it. Um, and then we move water around between the, the three columns. So when we talk to people from Turbine, they go, oh my God, you know, you have a ballast system. And then I talk to sailors and they're like, yeah, sure, we do that on our boats all the time, you know. <laughs> it's not a big deal. But basically, this ballast system lets us keep the turbine vertical. And, and with the turbine vertical, we produce more power. It's, it's easier to design, and, and it works great. Um, cost is going down. I think the, the last thing that, that's where, you know, that I need to mention about floating versus fixed, and that's, that's what I wanted to say before, but I wanted to wait for this slide, is today, in, if you install your turbine on a fixed foundation, that means you have to install your foundation offshore, and then you come in and you install your turbine. That means that you need vessels of a day rate of about 200 to $300,000 per day. Those are huge, huge trained vessels that the offshore oil and gas industry uses. Now imagine that you can put your turbine on the floater before you get out. Then you can use a land-based train. And the cost of those trains is about $10,000 per day, not $200,000. And that's a total paradigm shift to, to floating wind. You install the turbines at K side, and then you tow and, and you enter your systems. Usually, you pre you preset your anchors first, and then you connect your 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 anchors. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the the wind float one. Uh, so the first thing that that you're doing in any type of industry is is to create a prototype. So so that's that's what we did. Uh, the objectives of the prototype were pretty clear. Let's show that it works. You know, let's show that we can say that it does what we say it's going to do. We can take it out, we can do it, we can anchor it, we can produce electricity, and it won't fail. That was our objectives. And, and we met. We, we met most of those. Um, this, I know this, this is a curve. It's, it's important to see, though, and I'm around, I, I know it's not too big on the screen, but what you see is a red line. And the red line is the power production of the turbine onshore. So independently of being floating or not. And then all the dots are the power production of the wind float. And what we did is we binned it by sea states, one to two meters, two to three meters, and you guys know about you know, significant wave height. And what we're trying to prove is that independent, independently of the waves, we would still produce power. And we would produce the same amount of power. And this is very important because now we can finance offshore wind projects because we can show that the fact that we're floating doesn't affect the production. So that was huge for the prototype. That was the, the, the biggest success. Obviously, we had to show that we could survive extreme conditions. And we were in Portugal, so a little bit south. Not the best uh, wind site, but very, very good wave site. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I'll show you the video. Um, so what you're seeing here is the, the biggest wave that we saw. This that was uh, actually a wave that we tested in the lab. The white, the, the yellow part on, on, on the platform is 10 meters, so 30 feet. So this is a 17 meter wave that, that went through and just cleared clear the deck. Very long swell, that's a 14 seconds uh, wave. This one is actually not so big, <laughs> but a lot shorter. So this is an eight second wave. Um, it actually bent a little bit of things on board, but you know we were designed for it and, and, and that's okay. What's interesting though is 
uh, in terms of design, the, 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 the wind float will move up and down in the very long storms, and, and that's expected. And so, um, so we can keep the debt clear. It's the smaller waves that, you know, the, the loads are a little bit less, but they, they, they look better. Uh, and then, so in, in every project, at the end, you have to show that, you know, you can decommission your project. And so we did that in 2016. We took it back to shore. We sold the turbine, and, and we, wet the, we wet stored the platform. We have, it was in a, in a yard in the, um, in the south of Portugal. We showed that we could take the platform out and, and leave the seabed. We turned the seabed to the condition that it was in. And then about a year later, we, um, we decided to do a life extension. We didn't decide, you know, we, we managed to sell the platform. So we had to buy back the turbine that we had sold, and they charged us a premium, if you see, you know, we're a small <laughs> company. Uh, and, and this is a picture of the wind float on the, um, in, in the dry dock. Uh, you see some, you know, after we cleaned, but you see some of the muscles. We did a full inspection. And then it was going to Scotland, so we put it on the back of a boat. So those are the, the, the big transport vessels. We put the turbine back on, and, and now it's off, offshore Scotland, so it's actually operating since, so it took about a year to do that project until 20, so we did that this summer, 20, uh, 2018. And um, what was interesting in that project, just uh, we had to produce power for that project before September 31st, and we could have, uh, there's in Scotland, there's something called a renewable offshore credit. And so um, we actually produced power on the 26th of, of September, so we had four days. Plenty of time, right? <laughs> Uh, let's go further. So, 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 what's next? Well, pre-commercial. So, what's for us? What are pre-commercial projects? Pre-commercial projects are now. We we show that the technology works. So now we show that we can finance the projects. This is what we're after. You know, non-recourse financing. That means lowering the risk to a level that is acceptable for insurance companies. And all of you guys have to deal with insurance companies in some fashions. You know, they're the most conservative people on the face of the planet, and they want zero risk. So this is our challenge today. Um, so we're talking about a few projects that we have in, in the pipeline. And, and obviously, the technology had to improve, but it was just to be more reliable. So Windfloat 1 was a 2 megawatt project. Our Generation 3 is an 8 megawatt platform. Uh, I'll give you an example. We can't see the Golden Gate, but the 2 megawatt, the Nest Cell, will be at the, at the road level of the Golden Gate. The 8 megawatt, the nest cell, will be at the top of the piles. So that's how big it is. So the 2 megawatt could go under the, under the bridge if you tilt it and you rotate the blades as you go. <laughs> <laughs> the, the 8 megawatts can't, you know, you, you know it's just, it's, those systems are just that big. Uh, and, and what's nice about going bigger is that, you know, the platform itself is sized, yes, for the turbine on one side, but also for the waves. And, and the waves are the same. So it doesn't scale up as much as, as the turbine. So you get more power for a reduced cost. So big systems are, are good offshore. Those are two projects that, that we have today. Uh, so we, we have actually three, but I'll talk about those, those two. Windfloat Atlantic, those uh, same site is the continuation, is a 24 megawatt project. It will be installed in 2019. So I'll show you a couple of pictures of, we have three, three units under fabrication. So those, those eight megawatts. And this is the first project I mentioned that that's what we wanted to do that has non recourse financing. That means that the European Bank and some of the other banks have actually come forward to, to, to the developers and EDP is the lead developers and, and they're putting 60 million in the project and there's about 40 million of, of equity in, in that project. So it's, the, the industry is moving forward and, and for us that, that financing is it's necessary to do commercial projects, you know, so this is why we do pre-commercial, so smaller projects. We have the project in Scotland where the first, the, the first phase was the moving the, the, the wind float one. So that's a 50 megawatt project. So that will be installed next year in 2020. And then in 2021, uh, we have a project in France, in the south of France, uh, which is four units uh, instead of three. And, and which actually, the, this new project actually is more about the, the next design, which is more about industrialization and how do you do multiple? That first slide that I showed about all the all the bears is it's really about that. You know, you you build 20 units very differently than than for, you know than, than 40 or 50 or, or 200. So we're spending a lot of time looking at how do we make it uh, faster. So you know, a couple of images from from the the the, the project in in Portugal right now. So we have two units in in the dry dock in in Lisnav. Um, 
that's just, I was there a couple of weeks ago, it's just tremendous how big those, thing, those, those things are. You know, you design it, but you don't see on paper just how big those, those systems are. And what's next uh, for us is, is commercial projects after that. And, and you know, I've showed the map and, and we have projects or, you know, that we're trying to develop all over the world. And there's one that's really special to me because it's up in, in Eureka. And, and I'll talk about it a little bit more. Uh, but it's with the Redwood Energy Commission and, and that's a 120 megawatt project that we hope will set California as one of the leaders in, in commercial wind. So that's what I mean by, by going global. Um, so this is kind of, you know, the technology, going back to, to the big picture, technology demonstration was, you know, early on, pre-commercial, and then now is commercialization. Commercialization is also all about cost, right? So we're talking about, if you're looking at, you know, a 500 megawatt project, you're talking about one to two billion dollars of investment. Obviously, we have to, to have crossed every single T's and dotted every single I's. And this is what this slide shows in terms of all of the projects that, we, that we've done. And what you're seeing uh, on the left, LCOE, so that's a very key word, it's the levelized cost of energy. So this is how much, it, you know, how much electricity costs for, for you. And, and so you're seeing at the beginning, you know, some of the prototypes that we've done, the pre-commercial projects where, you know, every time we're trying to do the cost down. But we get into a phase where we've, 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 we've you know, taken all the low-hanging fruits. So to be able to save, you know, two or three percent, we end up having to, to do six months of engineering for like one percent of more e energy production. But that's what we're after today. So we're looking at a lot of, uh, a lot of things to be able to, 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 to do this. Uh, so that's 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 where we are. That's where we're at. Um, just a couple of things about the, um, the the industry today. So in the U.S., very big potential on the West Coast in Hawaii. There's two projects. So uh, additionally to ours, a project in Hawaii for about 700 uh, gigawatt, and a project in Morro Bay. Uh, so those are the you know some of our friends, the project developers. They're really developing those projects. They'll be in the water hopefully by the mid. 20, you know, uh, 2020s, you know, 2025, 2026. So those are really replacing uh, gas, replacing power plants. Um, Portugal, UK, France, very big projects. France has announced 250 megawatt, their first commercial project. Um, you know, by next year, we'll have to get our act together and, and you know, uh, do some proposals. In Japan, uh, very deep water, so Asia is also looking quite a bit into this. I didn't have time to talk too much about the, the prototypes. There's, there's been seven prototypes put in, in, in the world. We were the second one. Uh, and then Japan put three back to back. Uh, and then France had, had another one. So Japan spent a lot of money on, on Fukushima is the name of the project. They had uh, a lot. But they're kind of slowing down right now, trying to get their legislations and, and their rules and, and things like that together. Uh, this, you know, this is kind of showing you a, a picture of, you know, all of the projects that are currently uh, happening, and there's 16 uh, gigawatt of projects that we know of uh, today um, by, you know, by by 2025. Um, I can't go into too much of the details. Oh, you see early on the first ones, uh, the the pre-commercials, and as you get to 2020, 2025, those are you're talking about two, three, four hundred megawatt. Uh, so that you're talking about, you know, 20, 20 units out uh, in, in the water. Going back to, to, to the U.S., uh, this is really where, you know, we're starting to catch up. What you see on the left is, is the uh, wind map of the, uh, of, of, the of the states. And there's a lot of wind in, in Northern California um, and, and you know, in, in Washington and o Oregon. And then on the West Coast, on the East Coast, uh, this, this little area, um, you know, between Maine and, and Massachusetts or Virginia, basically. And all those states are, are really pushing hard today in, in offshore wind. Um, I'll talk about these stories right now. This is what's very, very interesting. Uh, so those are sites. So, so what you do, you know, we talked about site. You know, if you want to develop a project, you want to have site control. Site control is, is the number one thing, you know, so you can develop. And then you want, then you want uh, a power purchase agreement, so someone that's going to buy your power. Once you have those two things, you have site control and you have power, you can start developing, investing money and developing your, your, your project. The Bureau of Ocean Energy Management is part of the Department of Interior, is responsible for giving you, uh, giving project, uh, uh, a lease, the authorization to develop a project. And so the way they do this in oil and gas and the way they do this is they have, they set up, you know, small areas, you know, aliquots, and, and then they do an auction. 
and, and you come in and say, I want to pay so much for, for this project. So about three, four years ago, a small company called Deepwater, the, the company that did the 30 uh, megawatt, bought in a lot of, uh, you know, managed to get a lot of those sites to develop. And then it started in big over, so we're talking about three years ago. So that company, Deepwater, just sold last year for 400 million, just because they has those sites. 400 million, just, just for having the site. And then, so Massachusetts last year, so, uh, uh, um, I'm sorry, New York a year ago, so December 2017, there was a lease uh, competition, and this company, Statoil, big oil and gas company that changed their name, won the bid at 40 million. So they paid 40 million to have the, act, the, the right to develop the lease. So that was a year and, and two months ago. Back in December, so a year later, Massachusetts had three sites that they developed. Big auction, it went over two days. Three companies spent 135 million each to develop a site. So that's, that's really, that, that shows you how much interest there is. And those companies, you know, Equinor, which was Statoil, you know, oil and gas, Shell was one of, one of them, and then another Scottish developer. So it's happening, and, and, and we will see, you know, wind turbines offshore the, the East Coast. If we go a little bit further, then they'll be floating. California, we cannot have anything uh, fixed. It's, it's too deep. So this is our project. Um, so on the West Coast, um, you know, I, I talked about Mobile Bay and, and our project, uh, our, our CEA. So this is uh, the, the wind map of the, um, of, of the state. And what you're seeing, you know, north in, in the red, you're talking about 10 meters per second average wind. This is enormous in terms of capacity. So, you know, yes, it's very windy. Yes, it's very wavy. The platforms will be big but they will be strong. We can definitely make, make money. So this project, um, yeah, it will, will be in the water hopefully by 2023, 2024. Today we, we submitted our lease request to, to BOEM. Uh, so it's unsolicited and then they come back and put a site where they're going to go for an auction. So we're still trying to figure out how we're going to do this with the, UTI, with the, you know, with the site. Uh, the company, so it's, it gets a little bit complicated in terms of, you know, energy, and, and we can talk offline about this. But uh, there's, in California, there's energy commissions per, per countries, and they're the one that sell to PG&E the electricity, and then PG&E turns around, manages the grid, and, and sells it back to, to the ratepayers. So RCA is the Redwood Energy Commission, so we're partnered with them uh, to develop those projects, and we brought in two of our board, uh, Acker and, and Acker is a big Norwegian uh, contractors, and EDP, which is the, large, the third or fourth largest uh, wind developers, uh, to this project, and they're ready to, to finance it once we have those, those key points. Uh, and I think this is, this is what uh, these slides do. Uh, I have about one minute, and, and this is my, my last slide. I think it's important to show you know, economics and, and LCOE. So what you're seeing, all those black dots, so you're seeing on the, on the left, the scale is, is the cost of electricity. The, the dots are fixed projects, and this is the strike price. So this is the price at which they committed to do the project to do financing. So all those black dots are where the, where, you know, the, the projects will get developed. $40, uh, $40 per megawatt, that's four cents per kilowatt, if you talk about solar. That's what will be by 2025. The green arrow is our projections of what the wind float and what floating will be. And yes, we're further offshore. Yes, the platforms are bigger, but the installation costs are a lot less because of those boats, because we go faster. And, and we're basically, we can be, uh, we can be competitive. Um, some uh, key takeaway and conclusions. We've developed uh, the wind float. Uh, lessons learned, we're incorporating those into, um, into our next design. Uh, floating wind is real. You know, it's not just princi principal power. You know, 10 years ago, they had a crazy idea to do something like that. There's major players, major money, and, and we're starting to have a lot of competitors, which, which is good. It, it pushes everybody. Um, there's 150 megawatt of, of projects today that are under fabrication. Um, we've got, you know, a good share of, of, of that market, but we need to continue. And, and now we're thinking about supply chain. We're talking about industrialization. We're talking about how do we do, you know, commercial grade project. And Northern California is the next gold rush, um, and it's going to be about offshore wind. I think this, this is really, uh, the last slide is, it starts with, with a vision, you know, the, the wind float starts with a concept on, on papers, and, and you see in the background, you know, then, then you get something built, and, uh, and, and this is what we're after. You're seeing lots of, uh, lots of wind floats and lots of offshore wind. So, thank you.
Wonderful. Welcome again to the Wednesday Yachting Lunch, and our guest today is Dominic Rodier. He's a sailor and a PhD naval architect from UC Berkeley and the CTO of Principal Power. So you said that the 150 um, uh, megawatts of power is under construction right now. Yes. What percentage of total California consumption would 150 megawatts be? California is about three, four gigawatts. So, you know, five, yeah, maybe five, five percent. Five percent. Yeah. Okay. What's the crossover when you do traditional deployments of these towers? Uh, what's the payback? How, how far is the payback out? So how you many years? You finance for 15 and then you operate for 25. So that's, that's pretty standard. So you, it used to be 20, 20 years. Uh, the turbine now has warranties for 25 performance for 25 years. So we're designing the projects for 25 years. The turbine is, is really the critical ones. When, all, when we run all of our financial models, uh, the financing part is, is about f uh, 15%. It's, it's, it's starting to be an industry that, um, you know, we really have to look at the cost down. And so when you look at company like Orsted and, and those, the way they finance the projects are more on, on, on the back of pension plans than on the back of, of bids. So, you're t you, you know, by doing that, they're, they're able to lower the, the interest rates that, that they charge. Used to be, you know, you wanted to see, you know, double, st double figures in, in your interest rates. And there's no way we can do projects like this. And so those, those developers have really done a huge amount of work in finding cheap capital. Uh, obviously, when you, you, you know, when you're looking for cheap capital, the risk has to be low. And, and so it's a diversification of multiple projects uh, across multiple countries. And, uh, and um, yeah. And some, yeah so when you say 20 years, do you mean that's the useful life of the equipment or do you mean that's the payback period? No, 15 years is the payback. 15 years for payback. 25 okay. years for operation. So it's designed okay. to operate for 25 years. Okay. So, so, yeah. so help us get a scale. What's the typical water depth of a typical deployment? So everything in, in the North Sea is probably, well, not everything, but probably less than, nine, more than 90% is under 40 meters of, of water depth. 40 meters is 120 feet? So 120 feet, feet. yes. Yeah, okay, sorry. is that a typical 120 feet? So it goes from, no, it goes from five, from, uh, five, me you know, from five feet to 220 feet. What's the, deepest, what's the deepest deployment you've done, deepest water depth deployment? So our project in California is 700 meters. Of what 2,100 feet, a third 21. of a mile. Okay. Yes, same, same, same as Hawaii. We haven't developed it, but you know that's what we're doing now. If you think about an oil and gas platform, the deepest platforms that have been anchors are in you know 10, 10, 10 kilometers. So you know 30 10, 10 kilometers. 10 kilometers. Yeah, that's how deep we we anchor. We as a as a human species, we can anchor stuff uh -huh. uh, in in that deep waters. Those are big oil rigs in in the Gulf of Mexico. Is that 30,000 feet? Yeah. 30,000 feet. Yeah. Okay. So it's not permanent, but yeah. it's, you know, while, while they're looking for oil, yeah. they, they have to, to drill down, and then mm -hmm. they, they drill down another, you know, 40, 50,000 feet. So uh, just to help us with the scale, on these 120-foot depth deployments, where the water's 120 yes. feet deep, how far apart are the three anchors in distance at the bottom of the, in the ocean? I assume it's about 45 degrees. Um, okay, I, 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 45 I, degrees out. Yeah. Not counting the catenary curve of the chain, right. just a direct yeah. line, straight Give line. Or take. So, uh, uh -huh. you know, and, and as you did in So it's a tripod on three legs that have 45 degree angle out to the anchors. Okay. Right, so as you get into shallow and shallow water, actually, it works backwards. You have less catenary, so you need more payout. Uh, and so, um, you, you know, you, the, the moon lines for wind float one are about a kilometer long. Um, the for for our wind float, you know, as you did, because wind float one is in 40 meters of water depth. Wind float Atlantic is in uh, 70 meters of water depth, and and we're talking about you know five six hundred meters, so we can actually minimize the footprint. But this is what we're talking about. So us mortals who sail under the Golden Gate Bridge just have to marvel at the concept of a technology that's as tall as the Golden Gate Bridge. Yeah. Now, can you describe to us? the tallest deployment you've done so far using the Golden Gate Bridge is the height standard. How tall is the tallest currently deployed or been deployed to date? Right, so that's the, the, the tallest one. So the, the wind tower. one, the tower, the nacelle, not the blades, the nacelle is at the height of, of where the cars are. Of the, the top of, of the towers. Of the, the wind float one, uh -huh. the, the prototype, the one that we're building today in, in Portugal. So it's a eight megawatt turbine. It's, it's 
100 meters, so 300 feet, so it's the top of the tower. That's what the nacelle is. And then you have to add another 240 feet for the blade. Okay, because the, cause the, the, ro the roadbed in the Golden Gate it's Bridge about is... It's 70. Yeah, it's 240 or so. Yeah. And so you're saying that the deployments you've done so far, the top of the tower, not counting the blade, yeah. is at about that height. That's right. And the newer ones you're going to do are going to be as tall as the towers. That's, that's correct. Okay. Just about. Pretty amazing. Um, so when we're talking about one of the, the uh, turbine blades, yes. they're usually three-bladed, as mm -hmm. I've been seeing. And um, <clears throat> so when those blades are spinning around uh, and they've got 70-yard radius, 120-foot radius, which is going some. I mean, if we think about, uh, you know, uh, 200 feet, 70 yards, 210 feet, that's past the end of the building here. So these are really long blades. And so when they're rotating, the um, the rodeo, sp the speed at the tip, the tip of the blades is incredibly fast. At what rotation so rate is that the speed of sound? So the tip of the, so you don't want it to the speed of sound. Yes, that's why I'm asking. So. <laughs> So it doesn't We're going to deploy one so, and we so want to know about these so, limits. So, so basically, the tip of the blade is subsonic. So the bigger the turbine, that's good. the that's slower good. you will go. Um, but that's, that's, that's strong. So you're talking about you know, three, four seconds to do a, a, a four, four seconds four rotation. To, to do a full rotation. Obviously, as you get bigger, it, it gets slower. But that tip speed is, is, is subsonic. That's one of the criteria for, yeah. for turbine. That's our criteria. So. We, agree already, <laughs> we agree to subsonic tip speed. Now, we have some questions from the audience. Awesome. Um, Daru's handling the microphone day, which is wonderful, Daru. Uh, yes, give us our first questioner. Great. Well, I've got the mic, so I can do the first question. Perfect. <laughs> I've got the advantage yes. here. To take you off the numbers for a moment um, and all the calculations, when you were studying for your PhD as a naval architect, you had a focus of what you were going to do. I'm guessing this wasn't it. What were you going to do? <laughs> I was going to play in the ocean, so that you was what? I was going to play with the ocean. Play I, with the ocean. Yeah, it was. I've always wanted. You know, I grew up sailing. Um, you know, Rich is here. You know, I was joking at lunch. The, when I came to Berkeley, um, I got a job at OCSC before I even started classes. Uh, <laughs> my my PhD was on wall damping of bilge steels for tankers, and so you know when you have ships that move back and forth. Uh, so there's bilge shields on, on the side. So that's... Wait, say that bilge shields? Bilge kills. Oh, bilge kills. Yeah. So bilge kills. So that's, you know, and looking at the voltage shedding that happens and the viscous damping that comes out of that. So in Berkeley, we can really dig out for a while. And how did this <laughs> transition happen then that you went from that idea oh. to now this? Oh. Then I moved to Houston for three years and I worked for ExxonMobil. I went dark. I went really dark. <laughs> And, and crossed over. And three years later, uh, and a friend of mine from Berkeley was there. And three years, uh, three years later, our wives decided to move back to California, and I had to show it to my boss and say, "My wife's moving back to California." And he said, "I'm sorry." I said, "No, I'm following her." <laughs> That's great. So Thank I you. moved back in 2003, and I had a small company doing a lot of, uh, never, you know, never architecture work. We worked for the Navy. We worked for oil and gas. We worked for wave energy devices. I worked on the Pirate of the Caribbean movie uh, on, 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 on things like that. So really fun stuff. And, and eventually, you know, our heart was in climate change and renewable. And uh, so more and more we got rid of the... But, uh, sometimes I'm joking because Shell and Chauvin they actually financed the wind float. Um, but eventually we just transitioned more and more into this because this, this is what makes sense for us. More about Johnny Depp later, but I'll pass the mic over to Lynn right now for the next question. Lynn Monroe. I may have been um, dreaming along on something else when you were telling us how you how the floating wind floats actually stay in position, not the ones that are uh, anchored on the sh in the shallow area, but out in the deep. How do they s stay together in a line, and how do you anchor those in there? So they're anchored. There, there's three lines, one from each column that goes out. Imagine your boat anchor, yes. you know, and imagine that it's 12 tons, and it's uh -huh. about the size of two tables put together, uh -huh. and, and that's the anchors that we use, but they look fairly similar to a boat anchor. Then there's chain, a big heavy chain on the bottom, and then um, you know, chain and rod, same as your sailboat, except your, you, you know, your rod is you know, this big in 
time. You know? Exactly. <laughs> but and and the chain link is 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 about this big. It's about yeah. uh, the links are like this. One is about thirty kilos. So <coughs> Thank you. Now I understand. Thanks. The big stuff. Um, so what's the what's the total addressable market? Is there a TAM, a published TAM for um, this kind of offshore wind power? Is it what percent of total power capacity uh, are you imagining you guys can? Is the marketplace for this? There, 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 there is, and so you, you know, it's an excellent question because back in, in September, the last thing that uh, Governor Brown did was to sign SB 100. Uh, SB 100 commits California to 100% uh, to an basically uh, an electrical state, uh, zero emission. Uh, that's both transport and generation. So imagine, you know, no gas car in by 2045. So imagine the California without any gas stations, and and then in terms of generation. You know, it means no gas, mm -hmm. and and so it's going to be a combination of solar, mm -hmm. wind, distributed solar on people's roof, and and storage, mm -hmm. and and that's what we're after. So and so, just to be clear, the benefits of offshore wind are you don't have to worry about the um, disturbing uh, people who are close to shore. You don't have to worry about fishing villages and yachtsmen getting hit by propellers. So you want to go farther away from traffic. Mm -hmm. Don't build right here close where all the traffic is. That's the key benefit of offshore wind. Is the other benefit that you've got more breeze That's and you right. can go where the breeze is. So better breeze and 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 you know the there's more space. Now the fishermen will always tell you that where you put your your platform is where all the fishes are. That's what they've been telling uh, us for sure. <laughs> But you, you know, <laughs> we have to work with all, all of the, the stakeholders. We have to work with, you know, in California, we have to work a lot with, with the Navy, and, and most of the sites are, are, are test sites. Uh, so we have to, you know, so there's a lot of discussions between the OD and the OI, and with a little fish in the middle says, hey. Kim Dessinger has a question. So I assume that you need cable going to shore to deliver the electricity. That's and correct. The farther offshore you are, the bigger, the longer the cable has to be. That's correct. And that's just a small component of your cost. It's a big component of the cost. Okay. It's, but at the same time, you know, if you're 20 kilometers or if you're 50 kilometers, you, you know, the big part, you know, the substation, all the infrastructure is is expensive. Uh, but it is, it is one one thing. Uh, the industry is also looking very. You know, I said, you know, we have to look at, you know, you know everything. We're moving. So t today, you know, before it used to be 33,000 volts, the, the cables. Now it's 66,000. We're looking into 128,000 volts for the next five years. We're looking into, uh, you know, DC and instead of AC. And so there's a lot of research happening to, to minimize the losses. Great. Are the, how big are, are these bundles of cables or what, what, do you, what is cable size? The, the copper road is about an it's inch. It's copper? Yeah. Literally uh, copper. The, the inside, yeah, for, okay. the, for the power. So you've got three, uh, about one inch. Then you've got your fiber optics. And then, you know, your cable is about this, you know, this size in diameter. Is that the bundle or is that the That's key? the bundle. Okay. That's the bundle. And so you'll have copper and then you have insulation around the copper? Yeah, then you have... How much insulation? If it's an inch and a half diameter copper, how much insulation? It depends on the different cable, you know, designers, but, you know, say a couple of inches. Mm -hmm. Then you have a layer of protection, so it's steel mesh. Mm -hmm. Then you have more protection. And then another mesh usually goes backward, and then uh, some some outside. Mm -hmm. uh, One more question: uh, uh, the stability of the platform, is it a uh, ballast or cable or a combination of both? No, it's just ballast. It's, it's just so semi-submersible. It's pretty wide, so we have a big uh, water plane area, and and so and in basically independent of of how much water we have, because we ha we have to get out of the harbor, so so was was stable. So it's water ballasted. It's water ballasted. And then anchored. The anchor is just to keep position. Right, right. So. A question over here. Yeah, Bruce. Oh, no, Jimmy. First of all, the birthday boy today turns 89 years young. Let's hear it for Jimmy DeWitt. <laughs> Artist, Mallory Cup winner, well, our famous member. My question was asked before I got this, but... The one thing, I guess you're a notice to mariners. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> we have an AI system on board. <laughs> All right, I have a, a, a one-word question. It's the word birds with a question mark after it. 
We like short questions. Perfect. Y yeah. So, um, I, y you know, when you look at how many birds, so it's not just about floating wind, you, you know, and um, when you look at, you know, the th this, this whole bird things, floating wind is like number nine, or wind is nine, number nine or ten on, on the list of bird killers. You know, you've got buildings, you've got hunters, you've got cats, and the list go on and on. But we can focus on on this. So, um, yeah, we're working with, you know, same as the, the whole industry about, about birds. What's interesting, though, for floating wind is that we're actually less prone because there's less bird um, further offshore, and they have a tendency to, to fly lower. So the, so the wind turbines in Portugal, the, the tip of the, the bottom of the blade, when the blade is at the bottom, to the water, you know, has to be 17 meters. In Scotland, it has to be 22 meters. So we have to raise the nacelle just to have a little bit more clearance because of birds. So obviously the developers are very excited, you know, the NASA is higher, they have more wind, they have more production. Uh, you know, we've got bigger loads to deal with, but you know, that's the, the bird is actually driving <coughs> the, the, the bottom clearance, so some of the design. You're so saying most of the birds are gonna be normally flying at those lower levels is what you're saying? Yes, okay. the, the, the ones that are uh, endangered species. Mm -hmm. uh, Bruce Monroe has a question, Bruce. Yes, I'm, I'm interested in some of the permitting issues you get into. Are you always in national waters or do you go into international waters as well? And, and who do you have to get permission from to put out your floating platforms? So lots in California, I think there's seven, it's either 13 or 17 agencies that, that we need to, to worry about. Um, yeah, so lots of, lots of permits. Um, in the North Sea, you go, I think there's, there's, there's um, projects in three or 400 kilometers from shore. So definitely international uh, water. So Europe has to deal with this a little bit differently. Uh, especially, you know, there's a lot of transition between countries in, in terms of who do you sell the electricity to. So that's also, you know, this thing about, about uh, how far you are. But yeah, no, but at the same time, uh, we're not the first ones doing projects offshore. You know, online gas has been doing projects for, you know, I think the first floating platform was in the 90s, uh, and the first fixed platform offshore was in the early 70s. Um, so, you know, we, we just have to go through the, the EPA and, 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 you know, all of our uh, uh, impact assessment and, and, and all those things. So, but it's a big part of, you, you know, the developing mm -hmm. a project, I think you're absolutely right, I think I have to mention is developing the project, you know, the technology itself is just a small <coughs> part, you, you know, to it. You know, the financing and the permitting are probably, you know, just as challenging or not more, and they take a lot longer. Uh, it, takes, it takes us about 18 months to do the design, uh, the full design of, of a floater with about 30 engineers. Uh, it takes about five, six years to do all the permitting. I, yes, sir. Uh, my, my question is an economic one. Uh, I'm not sure what the proper I energy unit of measure is, but if it's a kilowatt per hour or something, it, 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 how much is it from the, uh, uh, based in the ocean versus a similar facility on the land versus a natural gas? Uh, and I'd just be curious as to the uh, uh, economics of it. So Cost per megawatt comparison, I think. Yeah, so you're looking at probably the cheapest form right now mm -hmm. is, is solar panels which is about two cents per, per kilowatt. Uh, you look at wind on shore, which is probably six, seven cents. And, um, you know, gas is also around, around that. You know, it depends on, you know, where's your gas coming from. Uh, Natural gas is the same cost, you say? Yeah, it's about, you know, in, in, okay. in, in, in this. It depends on the markets, you know, obviously. And, and floating wind right now, we are about, you know, 80 cents. You know, the, 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 the prototype, you know, may, maybe a little bit more. Uh, some of the projects, the, the fixed project, were done at about 12 to 15 cents, and, and the projections are to get down to, to the seven, to the six and seven cents per, per kilowatt. So obviously when you have you know, one unit and you have to pay for all your fixed costs, the price goes really high. But you have the economy of scale is, is tremendous, and then going to bigger turbines is also tremendous. Mm -hmm. you know, if you think you, know, you want to do uh, 10 mega, uh, 100 megawatt and you have a five megawatt turbine, and then you have a 10 megawatt turbine, you know, you just cut your number of installations by two, and, and you've cut your number of mowing lines by two, you cut your time by two, and, and all those things. So the industry right now, the, you know, so the, the prototype is a two megawatt turbine. The biggest turbines today um, that will be on the market in the next few years are G and, and Sandian, and those are 12 megawatt turbines. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, six times the power of, of the one that we put out. Uh, 
so those are monsters. I mean, this is when we talked about the blade that's, that's you know, 300 and plus feet. Uh, you know, it used to be, you know, the football field was, <laughs> you know, the whole diameter, and now it's less than a blade, y you know. Gordon Danielson has a question. Hi, um, I find this very intriguing, the amount of money going into it and the complexity and what you're dealing with. And so I wanted to get a little different perspective on the economics of it. Um, it looks like a 4%, if you just put cash down, you've got about a 4% that you need to pay off the equipment, to amortize the equipment. Um, what is the rate of return uh, above and beyond that? Because it looks like there's, it, it, this is what you're projecting yeah. for the future. Uh -huh. w what kind of return is there projected? It looks like there must be a pretty good return, otherwise you wouldn't be getting so much money in it. And this is stripping out any government subsidies. That's right. There's, you know, all, all you know, there are, there are some subsidies we don't know what's going to happen. So mo most of the obviously a project today uh, is is different than, than than those big commercial projects. I don't think that the rate of returns. Obviously, you know, the developers, you know, don't know. That, well, th there's like ten people that know, and they won't tell you exactly what it is. <laughs> but um, <laughs> our, our, our modeling is less than, you know, is is single digits. I, I, you know, so we try to back engineer what 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 they do and and their models. And 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 we don't see you know double digits returns. It's I don't. It just doesn't. The the math doesn't is not there. And that's why I was saying you know it's like they you know they have but those those big companies they have access to to cheap money, you know to you know pension funds and and, and, and things like that. So it's you know even there you know there's there's a huge uh, amount of innovation that's that's happening in the in the financing world. So so yeah, I don't know too too, too much details <coughs> about it, but. Uh, we uh, two fur from the Danielson family. Mrs. Danielson has a question. Great. I, a qu I do. I have a question for you. About and I'm not sure how long ago it was. Maybe around 30 years ago. Walter Cronkite and a group of his friends from the Fort Worth Boat Club came up with this idea. And you, being a sailor, would probably be better to initiate something like this than some other let's say an energy company, but they got this great idea that it's expensive to move the platforms from one place to another. So they would sail them from one location to another. Have you given any thought to this? It might be a way to save you some money. <laughs> so we're looking at, obviously electricity is our base case. We're, we're looking at other sources of energy. We're looking this morning on the way here, I was on the phone call talking about hydrogen. And, and talking about desalinization, uh, you know, water is is I think is going to happen in, in the future. So we're looking at that. And so when you look at water, you have two options. One is you know a big pipeline back to shore, and you're producing water all the time. And the other one is is blimps, and and you get rid of all the transport, and uh, and you just tow your 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 water back to back to where you need it. So you know it's a great uh, yeah great idea. So, so when you do move these platforms out to their offshore location, before when you when you anchor them, yeah, give us a little picture of the operation. There's like three tugs. How do you do this right now? So there's uh, what size are these ships that move them? So the, there's one big one, and then a couple of harbor tugs. Uh, you can deep. A everything is very very specific. Mm -hmm. um, 120 foot. What kind of ships? So it, it was. Um, so the one that we used in in Portugal was the Liberty Two. It was about 45 meters. Mm -hmm. um, the one that we used after was a little bit bigger. It had a train, so it's probably you know 60, so you know 60 meters. So 100, 200, 100, 140, 200 feet. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So there's one big one, and and those are offshore vessels basically. So you know huge deck that's open on the back, and 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 your boat house on front, and then you have you know two three thirds. If you have to go through a bank, um, maybe you add a couple thirds. Um, in Portugal, we, we, you know, in Portugal, you're always late, right? So we were late and we were missing the tide. <laughs> so uh, they ended up having a third pulling the big vessels and, and two other thirds on, on the side. And uh, it was often, I was actually on the platforms and, and we're getting through the, uh, the exit of Lisnav and the third is moving back and forth and everybody's totally sick. And we're on the platform and we're like completely still. <laughs> like, <laughs> wow. <laughs> so once they're deployed, what's the weakest link in maintenance? What wears out? Soonest or needs to be replaced soonest. The the turbine for sure. The turbines themselves. We, yeah, and and <coughs> we we plan our our O and M, uh, operation and maintenance, 
we, we plan this around the, the turbine. So they have to come and access and they have to do their, 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 their weekly, their monthly and six month maintenance and, and we do and we do ours. Uh, we're a subset of them and we time ours according to, to their plan. And so when you go out to replace a turbine, which is offshore, miles of shore, you don't. What do you do? You, you bring it back in, yeah, that's, bring that's it ashore and, and replace it here and then move it back out again. Yeah, so that's, that's the big thing about floating wind is you can do that. And how often are you going to be doing that? Would you plan on doing the, that? The, the plan in the financing is once every 10 years. Once every 10 years, you're bringing it ashore, change the turbines. Change the blade. Change yeah. the blades, yeah. and then send the tower back out. Yeah, and that's the big issue with, uh, especially with wind in the US, where those big vessels that can install those trains, they, or the, most of you guys know about the, the Jones Act, which, which says that any, any vessels you know, coming in and out of uh, an American port uh, needs to be f flagged in, in the U.S. And we don't have those, those vessels. In, the U.S. In doesn't have US adequate doesn't have vessels to do this for you. So okay. the project that was done, Block Island project that was done, uh, the, the jackets, which the Jacket Foundation, were built in the Gulf of Mexico, and they were installed on uh, Block Island. And then the turbine, the vessel, came from Europe uh, all the equipment was on the barge. The barge was anchored next to the next to the jackets. The vessel picked up the nacelle, installed it, and went back to to Europe. So that was a 5,000 miles uh, installation from from Norway, which wow. <laughs> well, or from uh, Holland. Yeah, which is you know we we just don't. So right now the industry is looking at, okay, well you know how do we do this? How do we you know who's going to afford the you know, the 500 million that we need to, to create one of those vessels. Yeah. Lance Burke has a question. Lance. So I'm, I'm an engineer, so I'm very interested in the engineering aspects here. And one of the things about engineering is it's an evolution usually. You try something, parts of it succeeds, parts of it fail. You try again until it works well enough to be successful. Um, I understand that in Europe, there's been a lot more work in wind energy than here in the U.S., and specifically Denmark uh, had made some very, very large goals for the amount of generation they were in use for renewables. And last year, uh, Denmark announced that it was actually going to reduce the amount that they were planning on getting from wind turbines, uh, specifically because of fields of Vestas turbines that were having maintenance issues and costing a lot more than the initial projections. So as an engineer, tell me, what have you learned from some of the previous uh, install installations, and what is it that you think you can do to overcome uh, what they found so far? <laughs> there's so much, <laughs> there's so much lessons learned from, 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 from every project. Um, but you, you know, wh what you're mentioning is true, you know, the Vestas turbine that, that, we, that we use is on version 7 or 8 of the drivetrain. Um, so, you know, part of it is hopefully, you know, you go to a turbine that has a lot of experience and then they, um, you know, they've worked out themselves the kinks, you know, we, we don't design turbines, we, the turbine is, you know, it's a payload for us, uh, it, but it's the equipment that, that, that makes the money, we're just trying to, to do a foundation that, that works. Um, and your point was also very much related to what I was saying about the, the financing and, and lowering the risks. So, you know, you have to, you know, to me, w y y y you know, the, the choice of, of, of manufacturers is very important and, and how they deal with, with those. I think, you know, the, the, there was other issues in terms of uh, projects in, in, in the North Sea. Uh, there was one that, that was built uh, in, in Asia. I won't say, say what country, but it came back and they had to redo a lot of the work. So we have to spend a lot of time uh, doing quality assurance of, of what we do. Uh, we're doing a lot of welding, uh, basically, they're big structures. And, uh, you know, when you weld something, uh, at the end it's welded, you grind it, and you don't know, you know, just little details that you have to do, but when you weld two plates, you have to preheat. And if you don't preheat um, and you weld, then the, the, the life of, of the weld is, is not as good, but you can't see it until 10 years down the line and, and it's failed. So be, and, and the welder, it doesn't matter what country the welder is, he, you know, the minute you're not looking, he's going to put the heat in, you know, and, and he's going to weld. <laughs> he, 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 you know, there's no questions asked. And so, you know, we're spending a lot of time. We have, you know, people in the shipyards in Portugal. And, and when I was there, the, so our QA manager uh, was looking at the bag and it was the wrong welding material. So he called the supervisor and said, remove it. And it's like, no, we're not using it. It's like, take it and move it away from the platform. I don't want to see it there. 
because I know that the minute I'm not there, you're going to be using it. So, you know, that's a lot of, so it's not really engineering in terms of design. Obviously, in design, we look at, you know, how do we make things better and, and things, but it's more, you know, part of engineering is also we have to write all of the specifications on how we want things done. And, and this is probably where we're spending the most time is trying to, to understand what people can, can do wrong and, and making sure that, 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 that we fix that. So um, thank you for joining the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon today. Our guest has been Dominique Rodier, CTO of the pioneering floating wind power company, uh, Principal Power. Uh, it's great to have you as our guest. And with that, the luncheon is adjourned. <laughs> thank you. Fascinating. 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 Thanks for having me. This is fun. Yeah, yeah, absolutely.